Okay, hi everyone. Welcome back. I have a pleasure of announcing this. He has brought some mean waffles and some good lectures. <laughs> so the floor is yours, man. Good luck. Hello, everyone, and welcome to my talk about functional programming in Kotlin, where we explore the Arrow, Arrow library. Uh, previous today, we already saw a really good talk about functional programming uh, by that guy in TypeScript. This is going to cover some of topics in a similar way. Um, so you might hear some duplicate things, but I hope uh, this will add to that. Also, you can tell that he's a bit more of a front-end programmer in that sense, because his sheets look way nicer than mine. So let's get started. Uh, first, a bit about myself. My name is Thies van der Ven. And as you can maybe able to tell by my accent and my last name, I'm from the Netherlands. I work in a company called Jade Driven. And I'm quite, quite proud to call myself a software engineer because I'm very passionate about the engineering aspect of software engineering. And with that, I mean, I love the higher level concepts, the uh, underlying engineering principles, and just the general problem solving aspect of software engineering. And because I'm really passionate about software engineering, I kind of love to talk about it. So you all may think that I came here flying all the way from the Netherlands so you can learn something about functional programming. In practice, I just get to talk about my favorite subject for about 30 minutes and it's kind of rude to interrupt. On that note, my friends and family would like to thank you for finally getting a break from all that. But I wasn't always an engineer. Um, in the beginning of my career, I worked on this big monolithic application. And with big monolithic application, I mean like millions of lines of code. And with millions of lines of code comes a lot of complexity. And with a lot of complexity comes a lot of bugs. So in practice, most of my time I spent fixing bugs. And if I'm really honest, also introduce a few more in the process. But if you fix bugs uh, for a very long time, a few things start to happen, at least to me. For example, uh, you see, find out that certain bugs are basically the same bug, but in a different context. And a sort of quest starts to arise where instead of fighting these symptoms, is there a way to actually solve the underlying problem? Can I prevent these bugs from happening somehow? And in that journey, I slowly discovered functional programming. So I think it's very important to say that I came to functional programming through a practical need, not because I did any academic course. My mathematics is absolutely horrible. And if there's anything I would re like, really like you all to remember from this talk, is that you actually don't need a mathematical degree to do functional programming. Just a little bit of interest in what are the underlying problems, that's basically all you need. The mathematics is just there to prove that these are the correct solutions, but you don't need those. So what will we talk about today? Uh, we're gonna do a little bit of functional programming theory uh, we're going to talk about everybody's favorite subject in functional programming, monads. We're going to see how we, uh, we can apply those to a real-world application. And if we have some time left, uh, we're going to talk about optics. So let's talk functional programming theory. And a good place to start is asking the question, what is functional programming? And this is actually quite a difficult question to answer. Uh, since basically everyone would give a different answer on the same question. And even my answer changes over time. But right now, I would say that functional programming is a story about love. It's about loving your compiler. Because in functional programming, we really like to take exceptions that happen at runtime and move them to compilation time. Basically, we would like to create a program that if it doesn't work, it just shouldn't compile. Basically, the ultimate shift left in programming. It's also about loving your teammates by writing code that basically does what it says it does. Well, that sounds really obvious, uh, but actually that happens, doesn't really happen a lot of, in a lot of cases, and we'll see a few of those. It's about loving your cake, a bit more on that later. And of course, about loving your functions, because it's functional programming. So let's talk about functions. And most importantly, let's talk about function signatures because this is a nice abstract way to look at a function. So we have a function foo that takes a string and produces an int. And this is the function signature of foo. Given a string, I produce an int. And even if we abstract that a bit more, given an a, produce a b. 
A might think, yeah, that's every function ever. But what if your function cannot produce a B? What about errors? What if it something fails and it cannot produce a B? Well, if there's an error, it means our program is in an invalid state. And we, mean we need to short circuit, stop executing code until we either recover from that error or we just have to crash the program. So Kotlin has a few ways to handle errors, namely runtime exceptions, its nullability system, and since so quite recently, the result type. I will mostly cover the first two. Uh, the last one I will somewhat briefly mention a bit later. So runtime exceptions. For this, I chose like the very simple uh, problem, the divide function that takes two parameters and tries to divide them. Uh, and that also means that the second parameter cannot be zero. Otherwise, we get the division by zero and then the universe will just implode and we can't have that. So we do a check on it and throw a runtime exception in case B is zero. If you now look at the method signature of this function, it's given two doubles, I produce a double. The actual behavior of this function, however, is given two doubles, I produce a double, or I kill your current threat which is quite extreme behavior, uh, if you ask me. And the only way I know of this behavior is because I took the time to write a bit of javadoc on top of the function. And of course, all of you always write neat javadoc on all your functions. And of course, you always read the javadoc before you call a function. Otherwise, uh, let's hope your tests are really well or you face some problems in production. And this is what I mean with writing explicit code this function signature is lying to us. So let's look at Cotton's alternative. Cotton's alternative is its nullability system, where we now see that the function signature is given two doubles, I produce a double question mark. And we check the second parameter, if b is zero, we return a null. Just to make sure this code shouldn't be written in Java. This is not a good idea to do in Java, but this works really well in Kotlin because the nullability system is part of Kotlin. If you never programmed Kotlin before, all variables are by default non-null, unless there's a question mark there. So the function signature here actually is, given two non-null doubles, I might or I produce a nullable double. And because Kotlin's type system is quite strong, it won't allow you to execute methods on a nullable value. So it has some neat tricks uh, in the language that allow you to deal with it. And one I really like uh, is the following operator. So if we call our divide function, we can now use the question mark dot annotation, which basically says, if the previous value was non-null, then execute this method. So we do the times two only if the function produced a non-null result, and otherwise do nothing. And we can continue chaining like this. So we basically can always assume that the previous operation went correctly. And only all the way in the end, we use the Elvis operator uh, to say, hey, if the previous expression is null, then use this default value, 0.0, .0 and otherwise just use the result. So we're basically thinking in a happy flow and only all the way in the end, we decide what needs to happen if something went wrong. So these are the two ways that Kotlin uh, has to resolve exceptions or resolve problems. But both have a bit of a flaw in them. So if we look at the nullability system, we get back a nullable double. But what actually happened when we returned null? I don't know, it could be anything. With, with the divide, we might be able to deduce what happened, but what if a database call returns null instead? Did, were there no records found? Um, did, the database, did something in the database crash? Did the network have problems? We don't know. We don't have an error context. Exceptions have the exact opposite, where it doesn't uh, put uh, the, except the fact that it can throw an exception is not in a method signature. So it's lying to us, unlike the nullability system. But if it goes wrong, I know exactly why it went wrong because I have this nice error message saying that we cannot divide by zero. So on one hand, we have runtime exceptions which have an error context 
but doesn't have error as a return type. And on the other hand, we have the neurability system, which has error as a return type, but doesn't have error context. And I kind of want to have both. I kind of want to have my cake and eat it too. I told you cake was important. And I want, in order to find a way to accommodate that, to have both an error and an error context, or error as a return type and an error context, I discovered the error library. So the error library is the functional programming uh, library for Kotlin. It's still relatively new, which it, with its uh, 1.0 release last year. And it includes some monads, some optics, uh, some improvements to coroutines, and some metaprogramming. And at some point, it also included amazing support because they're inc incredibly active on their official Kotlin Slack channel if you have a question that's usually answered within minutes. So very, very passionate people behind this. So what's in Arrow? Well, one of the things is the either monad. Like I said, there's a whole um, mathematical explanation behind monad. But we don't really need that, and that's a good thing, because there's this monad paradox where once you truly understand what a monad is, you lose the ability to explain it to others. Luckily for you, I actually don't know what a monad really is, so logically, I am able to explain it to you. So in practice, a monad, you can see that as just a wrapper around a return type. Because at that point in time, the function wasn't able to give you a proper return value. If you look, for example, at the future of a promise, that's also like a monad. Like, I want to return a value, I just can't do it yet. So instead, I create a wrapper around that, around return type, and return that instead. So for all practical purposes, you can just see monads as wrappers. And then you don't have to bother with the whole mathematical theory behind them. So the either monad is what we call a right-based monad, uh, where it has two generic types, a left generic type, which holds the type of the error context, and the right generic type, which actually holds the type of the value you're interested in. If you then think left and right, that's a bit of weird naming. Well, I fully agree, but the error team didn't come up with this. This is just industry standard. Um, the nice thing about it is, if you ever forget which is which, it's just easy to remember right is right. It's also important to see how the IDR is implemented, because it's used, uh, is using a sealed class, which means that left and right are the only two possible instances of the IDR. Also, it means that you never get back an instance of either. You get back an instance of left or an instance of right, but never both. That's the important bit. So let's create some either's. So we rewrite our divide, divide function. So now given two doubles, it returns either an instance of left containing a string or an instance of right containing a double. So if b is zero, we return a new instance of either.left. In Kotlin, we don't need a new keyword to make an object, so this is just creating a new instance. And if everything went correctly, we create a new instance of either.write. Of course, um, this is quite a bit of typing still, and Kotlin has some features like extension functions that allow you to add functions to existing objects. So we can also just write it like this, and it's exactly the same code. It can even be more lazy than this. Uh, we can just exchange this for either.catch, which basically just puts a try catch around whatever you're trying to do. And if it uh, throws an exception, it wraps it in, inside an either.left, and otherwise, you get back an either.write. You can also see the function signature now is I get either back an instance of throwable or double, because the either.catch has a throwable as an error type. If you want to go back to a string uh, as, a, as a left side, that's quite easy. Uh, we can just call map left on it. Uh, this is a function that only gets executed if it's an instance of left, and then it can transform it into, in this case, a string. If it was an instance of right, this method just doesn't get executed. Likewise, if you can transform the left value, we can also transform the right value using map. Again. Same as with the left, but this function only gets executed if it was an instance of right. So if it was an instance of left, this doesn't get executed. So now we know how to create either's. 
but algorithms by itself are quite useless. We actually need to get the value out of it again. So let's go back to our value. So first we create a writer by calling a divide. And out of this comes either an instance of left containing a string or an instance of right containing a double. One thing we could do is call our null on it, basically saying, if, if you're an instance of left, give me back null, otherwise give me the value. You can also tell that the type is now double question mark because it's nullable, and Kotlin is awesome. Otherwise, we can, for example, do a default value. If it was an instance of left, return 0.0, .0 and otherwise give me the correct value. But if we're doing this, then basically we're not using the error context. And if you're not using the error context, then you'll probably be better off just using Kotlin's nullability system, and then you don't need a whole new library on your class path. So if you only do this, then just don't use either, just use Kotlin's nullability system. The power comes with pattern matching. The when statement is basically Kotlin's switch statement. So we pattern match over the either, and the is is the Kotlin's instance of check. So we do an instance of check if the either is an instance of left, Kotlin automatically casts my either to the, that type. So my either that value there is of, the, of type string. Otherwise, if it's an instance of either.write, it automatically gets casted to an instance of either.write. So my either.value here is of type double. So we can do times two on it. So this, there are some other ways to go, get back to a value, but these are just the main ways. And all have the same underlying principle. So IDRs also allow us to chain the happy flow, just like before we saw with the nullability system. Actually, it's so similar to the nullability system, I can just put them on top of each other. And basically see that they do exactly the same. So first we call a divide function. Then we call that map on it, saying that if it was an instance of either.write, as in we're on the happy flow, we can execute the next function. Otherwise, again, if the previous result was correct, then we can execute this function. You see here, I use flat map here. Uh, there's a whole theory on map, flat map. Uh, we don't have time to go into all that. Uh, so basically the short answer is, if whatever comes out of this function is any value, just use map. If an either comes out of this function, use flat map. And that basically works in 99% of the cases. If that's all you know, that will probably work. And in the end, we go back and we say that if anything went wrong, give me 0.0, .0 and otherwise the correct answer. So if you ever worked with Cotton's nullability system, you're actually already familiar with how monads work. You just maybe never realized it. So now we know what an either is. Let's see how they look like in a real world application. So for this, I built a bit of a pseudo spring booty, micro nullity kind of application. Uh, first, we'll see what it looks like without either's, and then we'll see what either's can do for it. So our application will create bookings to book a speaker for a conference. So we have three repositories. We have a repository that gets a speaker, one that gets a conference, and one that stores a booking, and a booking is just a combination of speaker conference, and returns a booking ID. So our service will probably look something like this, where we get the speaker from the speaker uh, repository, then the conference from the conference repository, we create a booking, and we store it. And our controller will probably look something like this, where we just call the service, get back a booking ID, and return HTTP 200 containing the booking ID. Can anyone spot what's wrong with this code? Or what could go wrong here? <laughs> Not you. <laughs> no. Well, what about errors? What are things that can go wrong? For example, what happens if a speaker couldn't be found? Uh, what happens if there was a database, uh, the database couldn't connect or something? We didn't take error handling into account at all. So one thing we could do is make sure our repositories throw the main exceptions, like a not found exception, and put a try catch around it, and actually catch the not found exception to return a 404, and have like a general purpose uh, exception to catch anything else. But we had to remember to do this. So let's see what happens if we add iders to the mix. Well, when we build the iders, I first always like to make the left side of the ida. And for that, I also like to use a sealed class. 
which in our call, case we call bad state. And that contains our domain errors. So we have a not found domain error, and we have basically a catch-all domain error that still has the exception. Now we can refactor our repositories to return idlers instead. So I'm going to skip the service for now. But look at our controller again. A uh, lot of code. We're going to go through it. So first we create a booking that either returns an instance of left containing a bad state or an instance of right containing a long. So now we pattern match over it. If it was an instance of right, everything went OK. We can just return our 200. Otherwise, if it's instance of left, we can now again pattern match over our domain exceptions. If it was an instance of not found, we should return a 404. Or if it was a catch-all, we should throw an internal server error. And at first glance, it actually looks very similar to our try-catch, but there are a few major differences. In order to get back to a value when you have an either, you have to make a conscious decision on what happens if the value isn't there. What if it's an instance of left? You are forced to make a decision. And this is a good thing, so I can't forget it. Otherwise, by using a sealed class as a left, um, I'm also forced to handle all possible cases. Because if, for example, in the future, a duplicate booking exception uh, is added, this when statement wouldn't compile because it's missing one of the branches. So again, I'm forced to be able to deal with all possible errors. And this is what I meant when I talked about let's move uh, uh, errors of things from the runtime to compilation time. If I don't write error handling code, my code will not compile. And I think that's a very powerful thing. Um, the only downside, because everything in engineering is a trade-off, is our service where we need to do um, some flat map magic because our repositories return either's, not values. So in order to create a booking, we need to do this flat map magic to create the booking and store it. And well, here it would still say it's relatively readable, but this can get quite bothersome. Luckily, um, Arrow has a thing for that because I actually really like to use this way of error handling. I really like the compile time safety that the air, these IDs give me. I just also like very readable code. So you might say that I kind of want to have my cake and eat it too. So Arrow has a good solution for this. And it's called the monad comprehension. And basically it's there to make working with these monads easy. Because all we have to do is put this IDA block around our code. And within that IDA block, if we have an either, we can now call dot bind on it, which basically says if it's an instance of left, just instantly return from this function with that left value. Otherwise, get the value out of the right side and put it into this variable right here. So if we arrive at this line of code, we are sure we're still on the happy path. And in the end, we need to return it. You might see that this function is now suspended. Uh, this is because Kotlin uh, of Arrow uses Kotlin's code routine framework on, uh, behind the scenes to do this short circuiting. Um, if you don't want it to be suspended, that's easy. Uh, just use either.eager instead. So, how will a service look now when we apply this? Well, we do either eager block around it. Now we get the speaker from a speaker repository, call.bind on it. If that went OK, we can just go get the conference from the conference uh, repository, call that bind on it, create a booking, and store the booking. So basically, our code is almost the same as it previously was, but now we have all the compiled advantages that IDOS give us. So what did we learn? Um, we can have compiled time safety using IDOS, and we can still do imperative programming thanks to the IDOS comprehension. So we basically have the best of both worlds. That stuff is really production ready and already used in production. Uh, this next feature, I still have six minutes to talk about that. Uh, this next feature is really, is, you might not need it uh, since it's more for very big domain models and such, but I just want to show it off because if you don't know the concept yet, it's actually quite a cool concept. 
So I really like the immutability pattern. And I'm really happy that I see it being adapted more and more and more. And within Kotlin, it has a data class which really supports the pattern quite well. So if we create some data classes, like we create a person which has a name in a city, we create a city which has a name in a street, and we create a street which has just a name. If you want to change the name of the person, but still want to be immutable, what we basically want to do is create an immutable copy of person with just the name changed. Well, Cotton's data classes actually have a copy method which, just does, the, which does just that. So this creates a full copy of person with a different name. And this works really well. But what if I want to change the street name? Now we get something like person.copy set the street property of city property. Person.city.copy, now we set the street property. Then we have to call person.city.street.copy, and now we can set the city name. So immutability is nice and all, but if you have a domain model with deeply nested immutable data structures, this can get quite bothersome. And that's a shame, because on one hand, I want immutability, and on the other hand, I want to have ease of change. So I kind of want to have my cake and eat it too. Luckily, Arrow has optics. And at the heart of optics is a thing that's called a lens. And a lens is an object that's made to look at a specific property of another object. So we can create, for example, a lens that, given a person, looks at the city property of the, uh, of the person. And basically creates a getter and a setter for it, where the setter, of course, creates, returns an immutable copy. So given a city lens, um, given a city lens, we can get the value out of the person, or we can modify the value of the person. Where modify in this case might not be the best naming because it's an immutable copy, so we're not actually modifying things. But yeah, this is basically doesn't help us that much yet because we could have just used the copy method instead. But the power comes if we create more lenses. If you also create a lens that goes from city to the street property, and create a lens that goes from street to its name property, we can now combine these lenses, compose these lenses. So we go from person to city, from city to street, and from street to, uh, to street name. And by composing this, we now create a lens that goes straight from person to the street property. And now we can use that to instantly modify the street name of a person in a deeply nested immutable data structure. Now you may think that's pretty cool, but writing all those lenses basically takes up more time and effort than just doing the copying. Luckily, Arrow can just generate these things for you. You can just put an annotation at optics before your data class and supply a companion object. That's where the static functions and variables come in. And Arrow will just generate a lens for every property. So after Arrow has done that, we can basically just call person.city.street.name.modify and instantly change the street name. And we don't have to create all these lenses ourselves. Arrow just does this for us. So if you have an application with big, uh, ne big nested immutable data structure and you have trouble mutating it, take a look at Arrow Optics or any optics library for the language that you're using. So what did we learn? Lenses allow us to see and modify an attribute. Alone, they're basically useless, but they compose and become very powerful indeed. And Arrow can just generate these lenses for you. So concluding, thanks to Arrow, we can have both a context and an error type, thanks to either. We can have both the strong compiler support and readable code, thanks to the either comprehension. And we can both have immutability and ease of change, thanks to optics. So I think I can honestly say that thanks to, uh, thanks to Arrow, we can have our cake and eat it too. If you're in more interested about this topic or just want to ask questions about functional programming at all, or like my I want to do, introduce functional programming in my team, but I'm having trouble, if I can help in any way, just reach out to me. Uh, I, you can DM me on Twitter, LinkedIn. If you want to see any previous recordings or uh, slides, that's my website, and uh, that's the link to the slides. 
And I just love to talk about the subject, so please do come talk to me in real life after this. Thank you so much for your attention, and enjoy the last uh, session.